ready when you are. Well, hi, Paul. Uh, hello, Jarvis. It's great to have yeah. you here. It's great to have you here. I'm still, yeah, great to still be here. Um, so well done for making it to the end of another World Telemedia. Well, uh, yeah, and yourself. Yeah. So basically, I think the idea um, behind this is for us to just have a gentle reminisce about what we've heard about over the last couple of days, because uh, particularly because you've been in most of the sessions, mm. the brave little soldier that you are. Yes, yeah, so all, all uh, 11 hours. So I thought, that through. I thought without dragging it out too long, what we would try and do is just to get a little summary on each session and to get your views on what the salient points were. Uh, and to then see how you felt that might translate into the editorial uh, that you'd be planning for the next 12 months and also to um, see how we thought that might manifest itself in next year's next year's conference sessions. So, mm. you know, the, one of the things that we heard a lot of is the industry, you know, continues to move really, really quickly. So in some ways, you know, what, what, what's hot right now could well be, you know, very old news next year. So there's a certain amount you can't preempt, but it, it's also probably quite interesting to see certain things that, um, you know, have, have, have just made a sort of a early appearance that might well get traction over the next couple of years. So we'll talk about cryptocurrencies and those sorts of things a bit later on. Um, but the first kind of opening sessions, really talking about the, the billing mechanisms that underpin what we know as telemedia, and that would seems to be universally now referred to as DCB, direct carrier billing. Um, and obviously we had some fantastic um, uh, data presented by Nick Lane. And I just wanted to find out in, in a few words what struck you about that, particularly in comparison to the same presentation last year. Were there any sort of significant changes? What was the message that came out of Nick's research and how do you think that will appear in the pages of the of the magazine uh well nick direct carrier billing was that only yesterday we talked it about was that? only yesterday so it's a very long time ago um he uh yes he's, uh, what i like about uh, mobile squared's research is that it's always um it's not driven by hype so it's always it's always comes in a lot lower than everybody else's but i think much more realistic uh, in terms of the forecast. And his, his sort of interesting sort of view is that carrier billing, you know, is, as we all know and have known for many, many years, is potentially enormous. Am I, am I, oh, am I slipped? There we go. It's potentially enormous, the uh, carrier billing market. Um, and, and you're going to see some returns on that now, finally. It's going to be huge across Asia and Japan was the thing that really stood out. But they've embraced using it for everything. So physical goods off of Amazon, you know, it, it's it's just a new way, another way to pay uh, that's really convenient. Whereas here in Europe, we're stuck with PSD2 making that sort of thing for now impossible. Uh, and I think even sort of focusing more in from Europe itself into the UK, the UK is still dogged by, you know, sort of perception of, of that kind of thing being some sort of scam and a bit dodgy. Which I guess is why people get so excited about emerging markets at this show, because they see that as being sort of absolutely. blank canvas. Absolutely, and, and a place where people will embrace it and use it and get it. And, you know, the further you go into Asia, the more they understand that. You know, they're, you know certainly in China, they're largely unbanked. I mean, they've mainly sort of embraced WeChat pay and things like that. But, you know, potentially there's a market, I think, for carrier billing in China. Well, can you just... Um, Explain what WeChat Pay is uh, and it's, how it's distinct from... Well, WeChat is a, a sort of social network, a bit like WhatsApp. Um, and they, it, it, for many years now, you can transfer money person to person okay, just yeah. in a message. So, um, you know, it's just become, you know, it's become a sort of, you know, mess it's, a, it's a message that, that then conveys value. Uh, but, but potentially, you know, carrier billing can, can work in all sorts of places. Um all you know, all over the world, and and the UK doesn't seem to have embraced it. That said, however, the younger generations, which we can't, we'll probably come on to a bit later as well, uh, have embraced this idea of subscriptions to things. You know, Netflix. Yeah, I was quite surprised Amazon about that. Prime. Actually, yeah, but if you think about sort of the things they do, you know, Netflix, Amazon Prime, uh, ASOS, even you sort of sign up to ASOS for a tenner a year and you get free next day delivery. Um, 
you know, all those sorts of things that they you know, and Spotify, yeah, you know, all the sort of cool stuff they do and all the stuff they enjoy is done on a subscription basis. Yeah, you know, even down to sort of their their phone package. You know, they don't pay for SMS, they don't pay for phone calls. They just get a you know a bundle, either a sort of pay as you go or on a contract, and it's all just it's all yeah things are just commoditized now. Sure. So. I think there is this sort of a whole generation of people that are growing up one not not sort of thinking of premium rate as sort of you know scam city and also not seeing subscriptions as a scam uh, who will probably likely embrace carrier billing if the carriers can market it enough to them well that's the other thing i was going to talk about because what was really uh, encouraging i thought was for the first time in a very long time we've actually got some carriers here and i know that going forward um to target more carriers and get more carrier involvement is definitely something that we're going to want to do. Uh, and I would imagine, again, something that you would be always have in your mind when you're putting the editorial together because, you know, we want to grab their attention, right? But it was, it was interesting to uh, have Caroline here. Um, thanks mainly because of um, her, her appearance at the, um, the Phonics event last week. And I thought that uh, Rob um, is one of those kind of leading lights now in the industry. Um, very enthusiastic about the opportunities, um, a street, extremely frustrated at the, the fact that he sees so many you know, billion dollar opportunities that just aren't being um, realized because of, I think in, in, so, in, in, not in, in no small part down to the fact that it, they really find it very hard to get that sort of partnership with the carriers to really help these things go forward. But I thought his, um, what struck me was he really kind of put out a real call to action, didn't he? He did. To say, look, yeah, very know, much we've, so. actually, we've actually got an opportunity here. Why aren't we maximizing it? There's, it's a big pie. Mm. There's plenty there. So on the one hand, even from the UK's point of view, you're saying there's a big market, but we're not, we're not doing the job properly and there's more work to do, which I thought was disappointing in some ways because the UK market isn't exactly a new market. But obviously, it was a good, I, I sense that the industry has now got to a point where in the UK, for example, you've had some consolidation and the, the, the players that are there are now experienced enough and have got the right sort of ethos to perhaps start engaging with brands, staking on some of those big projects and actually getting some traction mm. going forward. So um, we might see World Telemedia in two or three years time quite brand heavy if the industry gets it right. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I think, you know, again, focusing on the UK again for a moment, I mean, Rob is absolutely right. I think it's quite interesting that he was really vocal about uh, about how, you know, it takes sort of at least three months, at least three months to get uh, set up with the operators to do carrier billing, whereas it takes, if you want to put PayPal on your website, it takes about 30 seconds. And you think it is, it is losing them money it's losing them an opportunity it's losing them access to the market and it's all because the network operators won't sort of push it they won't cooperate they drag their heels you know and i think now finally people like phonics and and m gauge and other uh, sort of carrier billing based aggregators are in a position now to go look you know you might be o2 and Vodafone who are really big but i've got you know apple google amazon facebook you know, ASOS, Marks and Spencers, you know, all these really massive brands saying they want to offer this and you're stopping it, you know, so come on. So the demand's there. I think the demand's there and I think that's empowered some of the these more now sort of commoditized aggregators to be able to stand up to the operators and go, pull your finger out, we need to do this, we may need to make it slick and you need to educate the network operator customers that you can do this because you know the man in the street doesn't know who phonics is why would they it doesn't and they don't need to and especially when you've got a consumer base that like you say is growing up without all the legacy yeah. issues of dcb yeah, exactly. type services exactly. and they want it and they're constantly on their phones so they know vodafone they know o2 they know all that obviously the brands they really trust and identify with are nike and and netflix and amazon and those sorts of things but but they'll trust O2 to, to pay for things on those brands, say, or, or Vodafone or 3 or any of the networks. And I think in other countries, you're starting to see this, this already happening. I mean, just to, to sort of cut across you there, the other thing that I thought was interesting jumping forward to this morning was, of course, when James was talking about um, some of the brands that he's working with. And I asked a pretty stupid question about that because he, he, you know, as in, is this an unusual 
situation scenario and of course he's well no every every sophisticated brand now uses affiliate marketing mm -hmm. so if you've got big brands that are using affiliate marketing but the bit that they can't use is the is the dcb bit that's a kind of ludicrous situation totally. isn't it? so they're, they're, totally. most of the most of it's there Absolutely, absolutely. And, and things like the affiliate marketing are driving even more awareness of it amongst consumers and brands. And, and all that pressure is now focusing on the network operators. And hopefully this time next year, we'll be sitting here, there'll either be more of them in the room trying to justify why they're so rubbish, or they'll have started to do it and they'll be sort of doing great presentations about how, uh, how brilliant they've finally become did you, 25 years too late. Did you find... Um that uh, Strex gave you uh, or gave us, or can we learn a lesson from the way that things are going on in Strix, Norway? Yeah. But in typical sort of pragma pragmatic Norwegian style, they've just sat down and sort of got right, we all work together, we set up this entity, we, he, you do, we do this bit, and they, they can onboard carrier billing on any kind of brand in, in a similar amount of time it takes to set up PayPal. And it, absolutely, that's a really great model to follow. But you know people at Vodafone and O2 and three. Can you see them ever <laughs> agreeing well, on something that, like that, or introducing yet another sort of uh, entity into that into yeah. that sort of uh, world? I don't know. I mean, yeah, I think the other the other problem with uh, MNOs particularly is is a kind of cultural thing now. In that, you know, when we got into the business 25 years ago, it was very sexy and very dynamic mm. to be a part of a mobile operator, and they've kind of through various reasons, seem to have had that sort of dynamism kicked out of them. You know, we, we make the guys from Google here and they're all funky and full of ideas and young and cool and with it and, and, and innovative. Yeah. You can feel that. And they're, they're, they're ready to do business with, with as providers and with aggregators. And, you know, I mean, obviously Caroline aside and one or two others, but in general, the kind of mm. culture of, a, of, a, of an MNO the, is... I think the individual people are, are, are still like that. It's just the sort of corporate structure that's grown up around them, them has squeezed them. And of course, you know, realistically carrier billing for network operators is a very small really small part of their overall but revenue that's their fault. for now but it's their fault exactly and you know i mean going back to uh, nick's figures which i have here somewhere that you know he predicted that it could be worth globally sort of you know in the tens of billions yeah and you can expect to see that in all of our market marketing material for the next well absolutely months. yeah well, well absolutely yes it's, uh, yeah, five, to ten, five to ten billion in japan alone five to ten billion. so it could be the entire market across the world by 2022 could be 31 billion well, what's really interesting as well is if you think about a business an industry that could be that big it's represented by a trade show with 550 people Oh uh, yeah, but it? 550 quality people. Well, no, I, I no, I know. But what I mean is, I mean, for if if you're a if you're a, a delegate at World Telemedia and you think that the, the opportunity to tap into that that kind of potential, mm. there's a relatively small amount of people, you know, a, a yeah. very big pie. So, you know, I think that's probably one of the reasons why I'm, you know, certainly. I sense uh, uh, a real sort of entrepreneurial energy at shows like this that you really don't feel if you go to Mobile World Congress, no. which is sort of very great, lots of, you know, handing out of business cards and no real sense that mm. anything tangible is happening as opposed to if you come to Marbella, um, you really, you can really see people getting yeah, down and people actually do like deals, you. like, you know, are shaking hands on things here and, and it's, yeah, no, absolutely. And, but, but this, this, Year's show has been really vibrant and had a lot of that sort of energy in it. And, and I do feel, I, you know, like I said about Rob standing up and, and being very critical of the, well, not very critical, uh, but, but, you know, sort of um, calling out the uh, the network operators. You know, several people have over the course of the past two and a half days and, and they've done the same with uh, the MNO's sort of impact on affiliate marketing. And, you know, you look at the affiliate marketing world, they've managed to clean up their act and, and really try and make it, a, you know, a, not a wild west anymore. It is actually a really powerful marketing medium. You know, why can't, why can't we have this in, in telecoms? Well, you know, I'm was probably going out of, uh, of sync, but I was going to say, I mean, one of the things that came out of that um, uh, affiliate session this morning was, as, as we, we touched on that, that need to start cooperating. And I think that in some ways, um, you know, that's been a, a sort of call from the aggregators to the MNOs for many, many, many years. And I think in some ways, you know, they've, they, they've had, um, they've had it ingrained in them that, you know, coming to shows like this is just going to be hard work because everyone's going to be shouting at them. Whereas mm. I, I don't sense that um, that's the case now. I know that people say they're part of the problem, but I think when you've got, um, 
certainly the kind of creative areas of the value chain saying, look, we've evolved our businesses. We're much more professional now. We're working really hard to make sure that the businesses that we run are compliant. We know that's bad. Um, you know, we know that it's about the consumer. We know it's about producing quality content. It, surely, what more do you need to know? What more do you need to see to really come and engage with us oh, as absolutely. an industry, right? Absolutely. We, which I think is also why um, having a new head of AIM, Joanna Cox, mm. not that Rory wasn't great, but I think it was definitely time to put a fresh face on that on that association. Abs absolutely, yeah. And I think that 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 will sort of really sort of spur things along. And coming think. from a media background, I think yeah. that will help her enormously. Oh, definitely, uh, definitely. But I think that also sort of shows just kind of how much this has changed, is that it's now sort of AIM is, is run effectively by someone who came from the kind of media side, sure. not from the, the techie side. So let's so let's assume that the MNO is going to take absolutely no notice of this whatsoever, uh, and the consumers um, are, are still definitely. I think, I, think, I think we might see some uh, some some MNOs actually from other European countries that the UK MNOs will probably ignore. Point taken. I was trying to neat, I, I was trying to neatly no, segue into well, my next question. I was a bit uh, fair enough. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, no, I think that, yeah, I think we'll see ones from other countries. So, okay, well, and, and yeah, I'm sure that we'll be reporting on that over the next couple of, uh, well, certainly from six months in, we'll start Absolutely. to get a sense of what the um, uptake is on that. But what the, the re reason I brought that up was because, of course, if the MNOs, you know, continue to create problems in the UK, admittedly, but if, you know, DCB is, is, is doing well in some countries, it's not doing so well in others, the opportunities are massive. But what you said earlier on, was it's all really about the, the consumers. And we've got every day a new high tech breed of on the move consumers. They don't really care you know, how they're paying as long as it's trusted and as long as it works and as long as it's easy. Which brings me nicely onto the next couple of um, sessions, which we're obviously talking about the dark art of blockchain and crypto. So what I was expecting was, um, what I was expecting was to see, you know, wall to wall, um, uh, energetic note takers thinking that they've had years and years of, of trying to get you know dcb solutions or getting them shut down because it wasn't compliant enough and yet and here's now a great opportunity it's it's funky the kids are going to love it crypto is going to be the way to build for value-added services and yet i really sort of got a sense that the whilst people talk about it over a beer and go yeah yeah it's all crypto i was really surprised that the, we, we weren't absolutely heaving with people excited about um, about the opportunities and i think perhaps um you know like you said to me earlier on the one hand it's a very innovative business and it's always been part of driving new technologies forward but i i don't think people feel that it's quite there yet i think people want to to talk about things here that they can almost deploy straight away. And I think crypto is yeah, a bit blue sky. I, I, think, I think you're right, yeah. I mean, blockchain, we're all using blockchain without knowing it anyway. It underpins already quite a lot of um, sort of data processing. Um, but yeah, I think, I don't know, do you remember though, years ago, we when we used to be more focused on being like a premium rate telephone show, and we started doing stuff about the internet cause chaos and yeah. Uh, yeah that caused chaos and uh, we all thought people would be sitting there taking notes and they didn't i think perhaps we just you know not went too early it's good it's good to cover it i think we've so sown the seeds the blockchain and crypto which are connected but two very different have two very different roles to play in this industry uh, are out there and you have to take notice it's, it's interesting what you just said there because i i remember that very well and in fact there was um delegates would come out of our conference room quite annoyed that they bought tickets to a mobile telephone show oh sorry a, a telephone show it wasn't even mobile uh, and why were we giving them why were we talking about the mm. internet and now 12 months later that show doubled in size yeah and 50 percent of the conference was about internet-based mm. technologies so we're sitting here now saying yeah our well, crypto is not quite there and i remember um hearing adrian brink saying he was much more bullish wasn't he mm. david was a little bit more sort of reserved but adrian was like well you know so it'll happen and when it happens it's going to happen real quick absolutely no, so in some ways if you're uh, if you're a, a vas provider now and you've got your sort of existing suite of, of, of billing options um i think you really you beware if you take your eye off the off the crypto ball mm. because i think 
something's going to happen real quick. Absolutely. All of a sudden, at some point, the next six months, it will. I mean, if you, if you, know, if you just look at gaming, just gaming, not gambling per se, but, but all of gaming, already, like, kids are racking up massive amounts of coins and flogging them to people. So like coins in games. So that's a cryptocurrency. It's not a real currency, but it, it can act as one. And, you know, many people here have probably got sort of loyalty cards for Starbucks or, uh, you know, places like that. All those loyalty points are, are valuable to someone. Everything, in fact, is valuable to someone. And what blockchain allows you to do is to sort of understand the provenance of everything. So you can trace back where anything came from. And provenance is really what gives something its value. You know that it's authentic. You know where it came from. And that's going to really change, I think, the whole concept of how people pay for everything. And one of the first places you always see these things are in things like gambling, online gambling, mobile gambling, adult, stuff like that. Uh, and already it started to happen in adult with these sort of you get, get reward tokens for watching content, which you can then sell, share, you know, or you could swap them for coins in another game or, or you know, buy a limited edition gun in one game, sell it to someone else. You, you know, and I think that's the thing that it, it's it's the, the potential for it is sort of almost limitless. It's going to be fundamental in it's going to change the world as we know it outside of telemedia in sort of 10 years time. But but this time next year, there will be people billing for premium rate stuff but, using cryptocurrencies. So they should understand how it works and what the pitfalls of dealing with it are. It's interesting you say that because just to, to, to pick up, I mean, again, back in the old days, I think we always saw technology drivers coming from industries like this, pushing the web, you know, for example, mm. you know, those, those, those classic telemedia services, your adult services, your games, all that. Unfortunately, often the kinds of services that you know, set the ball rolling, perhaps in a slightly wrong direction. And often, you know, you have to correct the wrongs, you know, in order to move mm. forward. But what I think is quite interesting about, about this morning was we were talking about interactive media. And I was surprised that the, where David said, well, you know, actually the suite of sort of popular services haven't really changed that much in terms of, mm. you know, I mean, obviously they're, they're, they're changing sort of, you know, in terms of the sort of detail, but the, the, the segments are still quite similar. You know, the audiences still want the same kinds of things and those kinds of services are still being successful. So <clears throat> you would expect them to be drivers of, of cryptocurrency type technology, but equally by, um, uh, I think, I can't remember who it was, was, was I think, again, Rob was talking about um, an, a, an explosion of new services and I guess if you're developing new things that haven't, you know, that, that, that haven't been done before, it's it's quite likely that you're going to look at the latest type of billing to, to attach to that. So someone like um, Tony, who's at the forefront of games, is writing cryptocurrencies and tokens into the business plan right from right from mm. the start. Mm. Now, if, if if that's a trend. And you're a mobile a mobile network operator. You really need to be quite ner concerned about that, right? Absolutely, absolutely, and and prepared to understand how you can take and bank cryptocurrencies. Yeah, you know, I think it's not far. It's not a far leap to sort of think. Well, I've racked up all these cryptocurrency coins playing Tony Pierce's game. I want to now turn that into cash. Could Impulse Pay's refund technology? turn that into money sure and, on my and, phone that's then on my phone yeah bill. and adrian brink that could then say and you can just put, yeah use a use a card and take it out of a hole in the wall anywhere in the world exactly so, yeah. yeah and then sort of you know suddenly you're kind of using dcb in reverse as a way of, of cashing in cryptocurrencies perhaps i mean it's you know speculative but uh, i don't know i think you can't ignore it and i think the fact that there weren't that many people in the sessions isn't really a, a reflection of actually how important it is i think perhaps this time next year, there'll be a lot more people in there because someone is going to do something. Someone so, here this week will have said to somebody else, I need to do this with all these crypto coins I'm getting. Can you help me? I've actually already had an email from one of our speakers saying that they uh, did a, the biggest deal of their lives at World Telemedia eight years ago and that they think that they've done a similar deal. Really? Whilst there you go. I, I, See, I can't do say any more than that. No, but. no, no. But something, you know, that's what I mean, someone, someone and this week. And it's related to crypto. Yeah, it will it will happen. And that's what changes it. And then this time next year, they'll all want to do it. And suddenly, you know, everything's crypto and, and powered by blockchain. Just before we move on, though, blockchain is also really important, sort of understanding uh, traffic and where it's from. 
uh, in the fight against the fraud as well. So, Which um, has been a recurring theme. Uh, endlessly. Well, that was probably the most popular theme of, uh, of the whole thing, actually, was, uh, was fraud and fraud. fraudulent traffic and yeah. how to deal with it. Not how to do it better. But Not yeah, how to yeah. do fraud better, no, how to, how to combat fraud more effectively. Well, we, 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 we're just babbling, aren't we? So uh, let's, let's kind of move on. So um, I, I wasn't able to attend um, the SEE engagement um, uh, presentation. And in fact, um, from my point of view, in hindsight, I, I think one of the things that I would probably change if I could change anything would be the, the title of the session. Um, because it's a little bit cryptic in its own, <laughs> in, in its own right. Um, but as I understand it, uh, companies like SEE are really uh, are presenting a really cool model where they're, uh, they, they're, they're mixing platforms, they're, mm. they're working with big brands, they're also um, using vouchers, tokens, ticketing. And Nigel Tatlock, who's been uh, mm. is the, the head of that business, has been in, in, in this industry for many, many years. Can you tell me a little bit about the model that they're working to and what you thought was it was interesting about that? Yeah, I thought what was interesting about it is it's just sort of uh, there's no insult to SEE and Nigel. It's just that they've thrown everything at it. It is, you know, vouchers, tokens, prepaid cards, mobile marketing, location-based services. It's just like it's everything and it's all hung around sort of um, currently sort of uh, sports in America. Um, uh, the vast amount of money that parents spend on their kids doing sort of youth sports. Um, uh, yeah, I don't know. I think it's just it's, it's an interesting example of how to get a lot of different technologies working together so, to, to get people spending, you know, repeatedly, which again, then is a sort of, you know, the engagement part of it. They're, they're good at engaging and they offer them countless different ways to spend. And, and you know, talk to any gambling company, retailer, whoever. The more chart, the more ways you can offer people to pay. You know, the more chance you've got that someone will give you some money. Especially if you can get the brand, if you can, if if you if you can engage your, if the brand can engage the yeah. consumer on a regular basis. Yeah. And he rewards them with you know sort of money off sort of sportswear and things like this. So they're incentivized to spend. So they spend more than they would. So yeah, it's it's an excellent. Uh, an excellent example of like taking all the things that we talk about so the, and putting it into money. one service that clearly works very, very well. Well, I think you're going to be seeing a lot more um, press releases coming from Nigel and his crew. Mm. And I think, um, uh, yeah, yeah, you know, I, for us as well, uh, being able to look at an exciting content source like sport is a very good way of representing the telemedia business to a new group of readers or a new, new you know new groups of potential visitors or you know companies that should be playing in this space but that perhaps might not be engaging with us because of some of the traditional services we've been talking about you get a chelsea football club people get that yeah uh, absolutely i think you know hopefully over the the coming years we'll see you know not only sports brands but you know we'll see music brands and entertainment brands and all you know we had a panel about interactive media. I mean, the, you know, the, where these services are already sort of being used in fledgling ways by major media companies. Well, um, let's just, let's just um, not stick with the chronological order, but just on that engagement um, side of the business, uh, which is obviously essential. Um, we had the, the messaging uh, session at the end of yesterday, mm. um, and um, the mighty Yabutu gave another excellent presentation. Um, and I think, uh, you know, the buzzword RCS is being bandied around. You've got to talk about RCS. Mm. It's all about that. So um, what, what's your view? I mean, I, I, you're obviously going to be writing about that a lot over the next 12 months. Um, what's your view? Uh, you know, who's using it? How is it being used best at the moment? Yeah, today? I don't know. But, I mean, it... RCS has been knocking about in one way or another for 10 years. But uh, I'm really surprised, actually, that sort of in the past couple of years when there's been a bit of a push on it by Google who developed it. Uh, there's currently 55 network operators around the world who do it. And there's something like 850 network operators altogether. They think, so that's virtually none of them. So any ideas um, why that might be? I think they all look at it and think, well, don't this, is this worth it? Does anyone want a beer by the way? Sure. Because it's, uh, I, don't, I don't know. I mean, it's too narrow. The, the reason SMS took off was because all the network operators interoperated. So I could send you an SMS to whatever network you're on. Until RCS can prove it can do that, then it's useless, really. 
So don't believe and, the hype. Well, where's RCS going to fit in? We've already got SMS, which is what RCS would defer to if the network wasn't up to it. Uh, you've already got WhatsApp. You've already got countless other messenger, OTC messenger apps and iMessage and all the rest of it who do all the rich sort of messaging. Plus, you've got sort of one of the examples I kept being shown at Mobile World Congress about RCS was like you can get your plane boarding pass and all this sort of thing. But I get that anyway off the, the airline's app. It just sort of appears on my phone. So I, I don't quite see where it fits in. I think it's a great idea. To, to sort of revamp SMS and make it more modern, but unless everyone buys into it, uh, then where's it going to go? And and uh, the lovely fellow from Ubuntu did say that like Google just isn't really taking it seriously anymore because it's done nothing really to research where it might be used. It's not talking to retailers who ultimately be paying for it as a marketing tool, uh, and it's not really gone anywhere. And he said, now, I don't know whether this is true internally in Google, but they fear they've got another Google Glass on their hands. Uh, okay. You know, it was a great idea of technology, but, you know, it was just really lame so, and nobody so, used it. So going forward, you, you don't expect to see huge amounts of RCS uh, case studies coming your way? No. Telling I think, everyone more, that it's I think the more, in, more interesting is how telemedia type people leverage WhatsApp and Facebook Messenger and iMessage and stuff like that and app push messaging. Okay, well, look, we, we are doing really well for time. We're right on point. Let's uh, get down to, I think, probably one of the m most interesting parts of this year's conference. And I think we saw uh, the discussion around fraud prevention and compliance and that whole thing emerging last year. And, and uh, it took me by surprise that so many people were so interested in it. Mm. And, you know, I know there's a certain irony about that. And, and, and uh, you know, get, given that the industry has come from, you know, the Wild West and, and, you know, in the Wild West, there are no rules, right? But um, clearly the industry has developed and is, you know, it's a completely different beast now. And I really felt that, um, uh, particularly talking, um, uh, listening to the optics session, for example, um, I thought Jeff, uh, you know, really presented the subject as a real positive. Pretty nice, he's there. Is he? <laughs> Hi, Jeff. Um, I thought that uh, not just Jeff, but I think generally the the, the the topic is being presented in a very positive way mm. now. I think that you know, I'm sensing that you know, the the the, the networks have to put it front and centre to get any kind of credibility with their customers, but also because ultimately it, it doesn't pay. It doesn't pay to be running lots no. of terrible traffic. Um, and and, and it, was a, it was a recurring theme, wasn't it? Right the way through today when we mm. talked about affiliate networks and advertising, uh, uh, compliant advertising, all those sorts of things. I don't think it's a dirty word anymore and I don't think it's a negative. Your no, no, the, no the, I, I tell you, the thing that strikes me about it is that it's, uh, it's like the internet gave us social media where people would just send pictures of their dinner to each other. It's also given people this fantastic opportunity to be really inventive with how they try and scam money out of people. I mean, it's, and, and in some ways, you've got to salute the fraudsters for their ingenuity <laughs> and the way they, they leverage technology often before anybody else does. I mean, they're, they're using, you know, robots, chatbot technology, essentially, way before anyone used it as a sort of, you know, commercial thing. Uh, and artificial intelligence and machine learning and all that, you know, the, these hackers are, are really smart. Uh, but I think, yes, it's no longer a dirty word because it is, it, it pervades everything that we all do in our daily lives because we're all so digital. Um, so, yeah, people could talk more openly about it. And I think there's some really good, interesting solutions out there that we heard from, from Optics. We also heard from... Uh, Saito, who, who uh, do some really good, cool stuff as well. Um, what was that demo? Tell, me, tell us a little bit about that yeah, demo. Yeah, it was a demo. They, 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 it's aimed at corporates for now, but it, it's, it's sort of a device about the size of this uh, this thing that's like about the size of a cigarette box that you connect to your network. You put several of them in the cover of 100 square metres each or something. You put them in your building. Uh, and it will, over a period, short shortish period of time, it will learn the sort of traffic that's going through it. So it'll pick up all the legitimate traffic that you, that your staff in your building are doing. And out of that, it will start to detect anomalies and it'll pick up where people are doing things that they shouldn't. Um, and the longer you have it running, the more smart it gets, the quicker it can do that. And he just set one up downstairs in the, in the basement room. And um, 
it registers all the phones it could find within about 100 square meters of it which considering that was just we were underneath the show it came up with 1622 wow so i don't know whether that means we had 1622 delegates or someone has got a pocket full of phones uh but um <laughs> well, probably or, 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 of, or a sim card machine upstairs yeah, it's a lot of, lot of dialing traffic. dodgy numbers and he got someone to set up a uh, a vpn so you know set themselves up as a mobile hotspot you're just using their phone and we called it a1 dash premium two because there's a one premium Wi-Fi network already running. Yeah. So we set this one up, which would basically be like setting up a fraudulent Wi-Fi network, which people log on to, and you then take all their data off their phones and steal their identity. Uh, and it, yeah, it took it about a minute, and it just appears in the sort of list of things it's tracking as an anomaly, because it's very similar to the name of an existing yeah. network. Yeah. It suddenly appeared. It's just on a Samsung mobile phone. And you think, oh, that's really neat. And, uh, you know, he's it, it, selling it to things like banks and, and corporate offices, but potentially you could see sort of insurance companies maybe sort of using that as a sort of thing to sell to, to their customers. You know, because as your home becomes much more sort of digital and interconnected, yeah, you know, you're going to want to know if someone is, is sort of, uh, you know, all your, your Google Home has logged on to a spoof sort of Wi-Fi network that you don't know about. And, so, you know, they're listening to everything you say. So... That was that was a different sort of side of the fraud play, but but one that's more to do with sort of you know actual traffic and and um, identity theft. The optic stuff is more much more to do with actually spotting fraudulent traffic and all the network the affiliate networks we had in here. They all are really on top of affiliate on top of uh, f you know looking for fraudulent traffic and robot clicks and all the rest of it. So yeah. So I you know and I think it's really important to to make a distinction between people that actively set out to defraud a network of some sort you know in our case we're concerned about the telemedia value chain and and, and um, affiliate network clicks and all that sort of thing um, but you know one of the one of the things that really occurred to me when uh, that James said earlier on he said uh, well you know I can't possibly look after 3,000 customers and I thought to myself well I thought that was the whole point of affiliate networks. You only had to look after three, and then they looked after a few more, and then they looked after mm. a few more. So the affiliate marketing model is a brilliant model, but the the issues have become that by having that sort of pyramid structure, mm. you end up getting very far away from the mothership, and that's when the problems start. Yeah. So it's almost like the affiliate, the, the affiliate marketing world has kind of created its own problem by its very structure. and. Good news for Jeff, of course, because it's created a whole new business for him and and some of his other colleagues. So, you know, do you think how to what extent do you think the affiliate marketing, um, uh, you know, structure is is part of the problem? And and, and did you sense that that the that that sector is is going about uh, is, is taking the right steps to deal with it? Because I think so. I mean, I think uh, I think that you can sort of structurally blame. blame uh affiliate marketing I think under whatever structure it had people will find a way to use that uh to their advantage in some sort of uh, you know illegal way um you yeah, know that's just the nature of the internet and i think that you know i said earlier that's why this is now no longer a dirty word it's just you know that's what you get with yeah. the internet it's the price the price we pay for the the marvel of being interconnected um uh, for what you hear from the affiliates they are doing much to uh, police it and I think they are really trying. And I think with companies like Jeff's, they're, 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 there's more that can be done. Yeah, so so I, th I think they're trying to do it internally because they don't want to spend money on someone else doing it, but they're going to have to. So people like Jeff will come in and, and, and you know make it work even better. But like all policemen, you're always one step behind. Yeah, you know, and Toby made that point. Well, you're always one step behind the, the crims. So, you know. So I, I think that... Um, we haven't got too much longer. One of the things that, again, I was really encouraged by, and uh, and I probably would not have thought this was good. I would have ever said anything like this, looking back at what you know the telemedia business looked like in 1996 when I first started. Um, and it was a lot of fun in those days, and there was people making a huge amount of money, and some were doing it by being brilliant, and some were doing it by being uh, brilliant bent. in other ways. Brilliant yeah. in other ways, um, and you yeah. know. At the time, I think that the, the the companies that were trying to scam the industry were considered to be uh, dealing a fatal blow to what could have been a lovely business. Now, as it happens, 
um, the industry in some way, shape or form managed to, you know, perhaps self-regulate in some cases, you know, with more forceful regulation than others. But we're here now. And if you look around the room, there's there's a, a very large number of people that we've known for, for a long, long time whose businesses have become very much legitimized, mm -hmm. who are who are uh, you know leading the way, I think, in terms of driving value added services worldwide. Um, and and um, you know who are is an essential part of, of taking our industry forward. I sense that the affiliate networks and the ad networks, which are you know much younger businesses, have also kind of gone through that change. Mm -hmm. And and listening to people like Karen today uh, and James and uh, and Jason and Bobby, you know, I, I and, and the guys from Billy as well. You know, I really feel like those companies have had a. a, a you know, are evolving, and I really and I sense that there's a real consolidation in the mm. market, and the guys that are going to be successful and that are here now are do are there because they're doing you know they're doing things the right way, mm. and and I think some consolidation in that space is probably going to be quite a good thing. Absolutely, and I think it's almost like you you no longer need the carrier billing summit show or the affiliate world Europe show. You need something that brings the two together. Well, where would that I be, think. Paul? What would that I, be? I, I, I think that possibly, you know, we might be sitting in it Goodness me. Well, as we speak. I think I think we've just found a solution there. Well, and, and on that note, I think, um, you know, there was, uh, again, to sort of highlight the similarities in the way that, that, that um, aggregator type companies or middleman type companies evolve is this whole issue with, you know, wouldn't it be good if we all sat around the table and shared a bit of information and, mm. you know, that would really help us as a business kind of, you know, get our houses in order. But in the UK, that's where AIM came from, wasn't it? It, it was spun out of, 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 of the telemedia exactly of, uh, right. yeah. environment. And, but, you know, we had different, had different names over the years, but basically that's where it came from. And I think now possibly is the time to, to look at how we can work with the um, uh, affiliate marketing world and the carrier billing suppliers to, to, yeah, to well, share so information create and create sort of dialogue and use that as a power to leverage the network operations. I mean from from where I'm sitting, AIM would be it's there already. It would be you know, really they should be they should be actively mm. um, well they are actively targeting the affiliate marketing sector, but the affiliate marketing sector I think should be becoming a lot more active within a body mm. like that because you know the, the infrastructure is there for and, and the experience is there, I think to tackle a lot of their problems. I mean I, I sense that the the market might think we need our own startup and they'll do their own thing with, I but think to start actually with they, i think they do, aims it, already there yeah but i think it's one of those things that'll start or should be started and then amalgamated into an existing body when the time is right i mean i think one way or another um as a as a trade show you know our ethos will always be to support healthy compliant um, profitable business and, and our job is to is to um, you know create commerce and it's certainly not our, our, our the role of the media to to sort of take any sort of stance like that but I think going uh, going forward there's absolutely no doubt that we'd be working really closely with Joanna Cox and I know you know mm. you'll obviously be spending a lot of time with her mm. and I think if they can internationalize that business a little bit like we have over the last I five or so. ten years it's not difficult well, it's difficult it's a challenge but it's it's not impossible no and, and well, I think and, with, and they have access to it through this Exactly right. To yeah. set that ball rolling, definitely. So, so more on that over the next. Uh, absolutely, 12 absolutely. So, so yeah, in the coming twelve months, much more on carrier billing, particularly sort of outside the UK, but I think in, as to how it can develop in the UK as well. Uh, blockchain and crypto, where they all fit in to carrier billing and to the general value added services market. Brilliant. Affiliate marketing, where that's going, how to help with that sort of uh, disconnect in the affiliate value chain fraud and cyber security obviously uh, will always be big i think and uh, the sort of evolving of all of this into the sort of more general e-commerce sort of world well, really you've, you just you just summed up the 2018 think, 2019 editorial two, profile that, brilliantly that, absolutely and probably yeah the the beginnings of the spotlight sessions for next year fantastic and obviously if anybody that's listening to this um, needs to get hold of a free copy of an excellent magazine. Um, it's paper, it's real, it's stuck together, and you can read it on the train because um, we're still old school, even though we're no, a high tech it's, industry. It's, it's all coming back, it'll all be back in uh, in fashion. All you need to do is go to uh, telemediaonline.co.uk, press subscribe, 
mean you mean that mean that you want to subscribe you'll be asked to subscribe three or four times and then um you'll be given sent a free magazine and we would urge anyone that's listening in on this to do that because uh we're obviously very keen to continue to build our readership and spread the telemedia word far and wide so um paul thanks very much for yeah, that job See you next year, mate. absolutely it's been a brilliant show thanks well done, mate. Take it well easy. Done.